Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. I just broke my own rule. This is not unusual. Praise the Lord. We're trying to be on time, uh, starting right on time all the, all the time. But we have an issue with the steps over here on the east side of the building, and we're kind of trying to figure out a, a way that we can adjust and, and fix it. But we had a, I got a, I received a letter from uh, Evelyn Link, and one of her big problems is that approach because of the, the varying heights of the rises coming up those steps. And, uh, you know, the older you get, the, the less balance you have and uh, so forth. So we're trying to figure out a way of, of dealing with that without having to tear the whole step out. And so we'll, we'll figure it out, get enough minds together on it. We'll, we'll come up with something that will work. So, praise the Lord. Um, what else? Oh, I was just telling uh, Don, and I mentioned it Wednesday night, too, just coincidentally, not that we're not going to do anything about the steps, but the, uh, the steps leading up to the temple were made purposely to be at different heights. So you have one step that is five inches, one, the next step might be eight or ten inches, the next step might be a foot and a half, or, you know, who knows. So, and they just kept going back and forth. It wasn't even a, a continuous cycle of, you know, 5 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch. It was 5 inch, 10 inch, 14 inch, 2 inch. I mean, it was all these different things going all the way up to the temple. And the purpose for that was that so that people wouldn't just rush up the steps and also that they would have to focus on their approach, get their mind in tune with where they're going, what they're going to be doing, what this is all about. You see what I'm saying? So it was an intentional thing. Now, it was a coincidence that ours is that way. It wasn't by divine instruction, <laughs> praise the Lord. So I don't want you to get confused with taking advantage of the deal. But So we're going to fix it, but I just thought that was a kind of unusual and got my attention anyway, praise the Lord. So let's... Uh, Get me uh, in tune here. I'm trying to catch my breath. I'm all excited, praise the Lord. Amen. So let's uh, let's start with the announcements. My director is right over here giving me cues, and, and she's got the controls, praise the Lord. Okay. We want to remember all of our uh, people in the armed forces, uh, men and women that are supporting that are uh, defending this country, those that have paid the ultimate price, obviously, and those that have served in the past, we, we want to acknowledge them as well. But we want to pray for our people that are in the military all around the world, here in the States and wherever they may be, uh, in harm's way, protecting our, our freedoms and our democracy. And as flawed as it may be at times, it's still the best thing going on this planet. So, uh, you know, we need to, we need to remember them and uh, the sacrifices that they make as well as their families that are left here behind. And uh, so, praise the Lord. As I say, we could all find things to be unhappy with in terms of this country. And uh, certainly m most of them are for real and they're true. But we have a... A, a way of doing things that that can alter that, that can make it different, yeah. that can change it. And uh, one of those things is prayer, yeah. probably the most important, because it seems like our legislators just have a real problem with getting anything done other than fighting yeah. and pointing their finger at one another. So, uh, but God knows, and he can change it, praise the Lord. Yeah. So we need to pray for our leaders, pray for those who have authority over us, as well as those that are protecting our our, our rights and privileges here at home. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, and then June 10th, we're planning a church picnic at 1 p.m. It's going to be at our house. We'll give everybody instructions or at least the address. If you don't have GPS, you can. we'll, we'll give you directions on how to get there. And uh, we want you to bring your own lawn chairs because we don't have enough. <laughs> and that way, if yours collapses, it's on you, praise the Lord. <laughs> but anyway, bring, if you can, bring your own lawn chairs, and there's a there's a paper back there that you can sign up 
uh, for whatever you want to bring. We're going to supply the meat, and I think it'll be like chicken breasts, and I, what else? I don't know what she's, a pork loin or something. And Okay, so, and there'll be, but everybody bring a side dish, so you can decide what you want to bring, a salad or a dessert or whatever, and then just write it down back there. Now, if it rains on the 10th, we'll have it the 17th, and we want everybody to come. So, if you know somebody that's not here today, or they come every Sunday, we understand, but they're still invited, they're still a part of the church, and we want them to feel that they're welcome, and uh, so it's, it's, you know, this isn't to show off our home. <laughs> uh, we're happy. I mean, we love our home. God has provided it, and it's all that. But I think the, the best adjective to describe our home would be rustic. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so praise the Lord. Don't come thinking, you, you know, it's a mansion or something. It's just probably like your place. So just come and enjoy it, and you don't have to worry about anything. Just come be yourself. And uh, we've got quite a bit of ground there we've got a couple and a half, two and a half acres or so so there's plenty of room for the kids to play and run and we'll have some games and different things and uh suzanne and and uh, mike have a uh, what do you call it canopy. Canopy. canopy that's the big word i was looking for so if you don't want to be out in the sun we have a lot of trees so there's places for shade but if you want to you know be in the shade all the time there's, there's a, there'll be a canopy up and so you don't have to be out in the sun if you don't want to and of course if it's overwhelming you can go in the house and we do have bathrooms and so you're welcome to use those rather than the trees that my grandchildren love to <laughs> water for us <laughs> but it's better than in the pool yes. so I, I don't mind peeing in the irises it's better than in the swimming pool <laughs> it's above ground pool nevertheless the problem's the same amen <laughs> So anyway, there's the announcements. Haven't I done a great job? I've got this down pat, praise the Lord. All right, thank the Lord. Anything else? We got anything going with this, uh, the uh, house of prayer? Yes, that'll be uh, the 9th, of course. That'll be the 9th. The 9th, okay, house of prayer the 9th. So, so fast and pray for it's Friday night, Saturday, and feast at uh, the Temple of Mount Sinai. We'll do Shabbat night live at there our place, praise the Lord. So anyway, sa uh, that'll be on a Saturday, the, the 10th. And again, if it rains, we'll have it the following week on the 17th. If I haven't totally confused you, I haven't done my job. But you can talk to Sally, and she'll be able to explain everything that I just messed up. Praise the Lord. Okay. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Now, what, uh, what else we got going for prayer requests? Anybody have any needs? While you're thinking, I want us to uh, remember Diane. Ron called me uh, Wednesday, and I, t uh, I didn't get to talk to him. I happened to be taking a nap. You know, you do that when you get old, praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, so when I was, because I knew I was obviously teaching on Wednesday night, but anyway, I laid down for a couple of hours, and he happened to call that time. But he left a message, and the message was Diane's blood pressure was uh, extremely high, and she'd had a real rough night the night before. And so we had prayer. There was only a handful of us here Wednesday night, but... Uh, he called me again this morning, and I happened to be in the shower when he called this time. So, uh, But I called him back when I got to the church, and he said it was kind of the same issue, and they have some ideas what it may be, but you go to the doctor, and they just want to prescribe more medications, and they're trying to figure out a way that they can use some wisdom in, in uh, dealing with this. And I told him that we would pray, and just we're, we're just going to confess that uh, that blood pressure is normal, her sugar levels come to where they should be, and and just believe God for that. Praise the Lord. So I told him that that would be our uh, plan for today. And uh, then we'll, we'll move forward from there. So we want to remember Diane. Anybody else? Okay. Amen. We want to remember Karen. Who else? James. Atkinson. Addison, okay, praise the Lord. We'll remember them. Yeah, Mike. Right, praise the Lord. Everybody that's out camping, boating, 
traveling from one place to the next. We want to afford to keep his hand upon him. Anybody else? Yes, John. Amen. And uh, I, boy, that's really been on my mind lately. Well, that is, I kind of outlined my message for this morning. So uh, we're, we're going to get into some of that stuff uh, today. And uh, if we, you know, if we're operating in the natural mind, we're only going to get natural stuff. That's just all there is to it. So there's a lot of things we, th we think because we have the Spirit, we're automatically operating by the Spirit, and that's not necessarily the case. So I, I won't get ahead of myself, but um, there's, there's truth in what you're saying, I, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but I do know that the answers are not going to be found in our intellect. So we're going to have to move into the Spirit realm in order to really see the, the, the results that God wants us to have. And if someone back here, was that you, Rita? Yeah. yeah. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. A lot of, lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of the men and women that have uh, served, uh, especially in combat situations, are dealing with, call it whatever you want, PTS and all the other things. It's traumatic, and, uh, and many times the, the guilt of, of actually surviving the whole thing is, is almost as bad as having physical wounds. In fact, maybe worse because you don't even know how to treat them in a lot of cases. So uh, we want to remember all of those men and women that are, that are dealing with all sorts of emotional and uh, issues that, that cause them then to do things that otherwise they probably wouldn't do. And I'm not just talking about suicide, but I mean sometimes it's suicide one drink at a time or, you know, one drug at a time. And there's all kinds of ways of trying to do yourself in without putting a gun to your head and just doing it in a split second. So... God is more than able to deal with those situations, and I know it's, it's important to him. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and also, that reminded me uh, in the letter that I received from Evelyn Link, she also asked that we would pray for her grandsons, two uh, <coughs> brothers that are, that are having some issues with drugs and, and other uh, things that, um, that God needs to intervene in. And she's, she's been faithful to pray for those boys all of their lives, and, and we believe that God will honor that. Jesus name so we want to continue to remember those two young men as well anybody else amen you know this is a thing it's not this is not a It's not like, well, this only happens on the east side. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm not right. trying to marginalize anybody. I'm just saying this happens in the elite areas 
of the city as well, and, and around the world for that matter. It, it's, it's everywhere because it's the enemy. It's the devil trying to destroy young people's lives uh, any way that he can to keep them from ever coming to the knowledge of Christ and maybe influencing hundreds of thousands of other people. You know, we look at isolated cases and we think, oh, what, uh, you know, that's tragic. But the truth is there's, there's more than, you know, the, the Jews have a saying, kill one man, you kill everybody. You, you kill the, the future. And uh, I'm paraphrasing that, obviously. But what, I, what they're saying is we don't know the progeny that might come out of that one individual that gets killed when they're 19 years old or 18 years old over something stupid just because they're young and, and foolish and, and uh, not using any wisdom. Uh, just in a moment of stupidity, you've wiped out generations of lives that could be, that potentially could be the next Billy Graham or who, you know, you pick somebody who has had a great influence on, on the Christian world and uh, that's, what it, that's what it can mean. So we need all of them, all of them for the future that God has planned for this, this nation and for the world. Amen? Amen. Sally, you started. You, uh, never mind. The Lord left me hanging. Anybody else? Okay. Amen. Let's stand and go to the Lord. I said this before. I'm not really random. <clears throat> it's just that I think faster than I can speak. Praise the Lord. So it sounds that way to other people. All right. God knows. He knew every one of these needs. It, this, this wasn't like a wake-up call for God this morning when we requested these, these situations be dealt with. God already knew, and he laid it on the people's hearts that did request it so that he could then move on our behalf and show himself mighty. That's what God does. Nothing is impossible with God, no matter how dark the situation might seem, no matter how long you've been concerned about it, no matter how long it's been affecting this individual or yourself. God can do it like that. In fact, he's already done it. It's just a question of us believing and speaking that into reality here and now. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of casting all of our care upon you because we know that you care. And we know, Lord, that you're, you've said in your word, which cannot lie, that if we ask according to your word, you hear us. And if you hear us, we have our petition. And every request that was made here this morning is in your will. It's a part of what you have promised us through your word. And so, Father, because of that, we thank you for what you've done in each one of these situations and each one of these circumstances and each person's life. Healing is flowing to them right this moment. Deliverance is coming to them right this minute. You, your presence that meets every need and answers every situation is with them, for them, on their behalf. And so, Lord, we release our faith right now, not for the sake of faith, but our belief in your faithfulness, our belief in your word to accomplish what it was sent to do. And in Jesus' name, we declare it is finished in each of these situations. You have done it, Lord. And we give you all the praise and all the glory for what will come as a result of it, for the lives that are changed, and for you to be real to them, that they may share that reality with others for what you've done in their life. And we give you all the thanks and the praise for it. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Roberto, would you do me a favor? Would you take up the offering this morning? Since you're already standing. Praise the Lord. Praise God. I appreciate you all that are here this morning. I know, you know, it's a holiday weekend and there's so, the weather's finally turning off nice again. So, uh, of places you could be, but I'm grateful that you're here with us this morning, and I know that the Lord will bless you for your honoring him. Amen. Roberto, go ahead, and if you would pray for the offering.
Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you as you give. As Roberto finishes up with the offering, the worship team can come forward. And we're just going to praise the Lord and worship God. Hallelujah. And thank him for his mighty acts. Praise the Lord.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Give the Lord a big hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I just encourage you to just continue to confess what God's done already. Amen. Just continue to declare the breakthrough. Hallelujah. Chains broken. Children set free. Hallelujah. Amen. To love God and to serve him all the days of their life. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Give them a hand. They did a good job of obeying the Lord this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. And the Sunday school young ones can be dismissed. Praise God. Praise God. You may have seen me turn around to see if I brought, left my Bible on the pew. I had left it here. I realized the other day this is how God gives me uh, more exercise. Because I'll go downstairs. As soon as I get downstairs, I'll think, what did I come down here for? So I go back upstairs. About the time I get upstairs, then I remember what it was I went downstairs for. So I have to go back downstairs to do what it was I went there for intentionally the first time. So in other words, I'm getting all kind of cardiovascular help. Praise the Lord. Now I just need some up a little higher. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless all of you for being here again this morning. Hope you're having a, a great weekend and that it continues to be a blessed one throughout uh, Memorial Day. And again, try to remember our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guard, all the men and women that are serving in the armed forces and have served over the years, praise the Lord. I'd like to begin in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. I'm just, this is kind of, I'm just prefacing what I, this really isn't my message. It's actually uh, just a little thing, something that I was talking about Wednesday night, but I think it goes with, with what we're talking about here because this is a very fundamental uh, truth of how we're saved to begin with. And uh, however that is, as we find here in a moment, we have to live out then our life from that reality. We're born again. We're born from above, born of the Spirit. The problem is we have a tendency to be born of the Spirit and then go right back to living in the flesh. And I don't mean necessarily about just being sinning, you know, and doing wrong things. I just mean not thinking in terms of who we really are and what God has provided for us and through us by his spirit. Amen. We live in a world that is, I mean, come on, you don't have to look around very far to know that it's carnal. I mean, it's just not a spiritual reality that we deal in every day. The world itself is spiritual. It's just that everybody in it is carnal. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. And so uh, it's really easy uh, to leave church and then fall right back into a uh, a natural way of living and thinking. It can be good. I mean, it may be moral and it may be doing right things, but it's just not going to accomplish and what God really wants us to accomplish in the Spirit. Amen? It can only be done one way, and that's by the Spirit. So, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, But by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God. So, you've got four major words here that are that I want to focus on just real quick. And the first is grace. Grace defined simply as favor or the divine effect on the heart. God moves on our heart. That's favor. So that we respond to him, amen, as a result of that favor, right? So grace is favor or it's a divine effect on your heart. Then we're, The second word then is saved. And saved, the definition of that is to be delivered, to be protected, to be healed, to be preserved, to do well, to make whole. The word is actually sozo, and that's what it means, to, to, to make you whole again, to make you complete. Amen? Uh, because before that, we were dead spiritually. We were alive, but we were dead as far as the spirit was concerned. That's what God told Adam. He said, the day that you eat of that tree, you'll die. He meant... You're not going to physically die, but you're going to spiritually die. You'll be cut off from the, your awareness of the spirit realm the way you've lived up to this point. So then the third word is faith. 
Faith simply means, we, we, we exaggerate this and we blow it up and we make it all kind of complicated and you listen to preachers and Christian television and they'll have you so screwed up and, and fouled up and freaked out about what faith is and how it works. And it simply means to trust, to Amen. yield, or to believe. So we simply trust in the grace of God. We, we believe in the grace of God. And, and we're saved. And then he says, then you receive this gift, the gift of eternal life. And the gift is a present. Praise the Lord. That's a revelation for most of us. Amen. It's just a gift. It's a present. Amen. And it comes as a sacrifice offering. He, pre he gives us a present, which was him sacrificing himself for us. That's the gift. So, we're believing in grace, trusting in grace, and then we receive the gift, the sozo, the all things, the, the healings, the deliverance, the, the prosperity, the, the wholeness, all of the things that God has provided for us in salvation. They're not other stuff that comes later. I use the analogy of, but boy, you go out and buy a car now, and... And you, you know, you go in and you think, okay, well, I'm going to get this model because it's, you know, it's the basic thing and I don't want to spend a, you know, fortune on this thing, although I don't know how you're going to get one without it, but not way over the top, right? But then the first thing they do is take you to the one with all the options. The sunroof, the moonroof, the leather seats, the, the heated seats, you know, the whole works, everything else. And you get all these add-ons. They all cost you extra, but they are supposed to enhance the driving experience. You know, they're going to give you a, you know, you're going to feel better about the environment that you're driving in because it's, you know, all nice and comfy and whatever. And, uh, and it goes faster because you got the big engine or you got the turbocharger or you whatever, you know. And, you, you, and, it's, and then it causes other people to look at your car when you go by. Praise the Lord. And you act like you don't know they're looking, you know. But like it's part of the experience, right? That's what they're selling. They're, they're, they're selling the whole thing. So Christianity has made Jesus this kind of add-on thing. You get saved, and then you got to get the options, your healing and deliverance and breakthrough and prosperity. That's bogus. It all comes as a package. There isn't an upgrade when it comes to Jesus. You get Jesus, you get it all. It all comes at the same time. Amen? There's not 30 Jesuses out there on the lot. Amen? Some have this and some have that. Now, religion has made it that way because you can go to any number of churches in the city this morning and hear all kinds of different. Some believe that you can be healed. Others believe, well, it's just a crapshoot. Whatever you get, you get. God may do it and he may not. Uh, Prosperity is almost evil. You know, if you, if you, if you prosper, there's, there's got to be something bad. You must be cheating or taking advantage or whatever. It's the will of God. Jesus became poor that we become rich. He suffered those stripes so that we'd be healed. Amen. He was cut off from God so that we could be connected and, and reunited with God. All of those things. Amen. He did for us. Praise the Lord. So look at Romans now. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and, and, sh and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you're saved. Okay? You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and you'll be saved. The heart we're talking about is here, not here. Amen? It's the, it's the deepest part of your thinking. We have all kinds of random thoughts all the time, as you well know. You just heard my opening. But, but there are deeper thoughts. There are thoughts that are that are really at the core of who we are. That's what God speaks to. That's the heart, the depth of who we are, our, 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 our reality. Amen? And so we believe deep down inside. And, and we believe it and, be, and we confess it and believe that God raised you from the dead. We're saved. You're sozoed. You've got everything we just talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, right? Okay? So look at Colossians chapter 2. And verse 6, that is a spiritual encounter. Because how many of you know, probably you heard, or maybe not you, but many of us heard about Jesus all of our lives. But we never made any connection in terms of 
personal connection. We believe that he lived, that he was, that he was God, but we never made that the favor of God. In other words, the grace of God never touched my heart. Amen. In a way that I understood and responded to it until a certain point in my life. And when that grace came, that divine touch on my heart made me all of a sudden realize this is more than just a book. This is more than just a, a vague truth that is for other people. But this is about me and God. Amen. And then you respond, and that's salvation. God in, in, initiates it, and God completes it. He's the author and finisher of our faith. It's a spiritual encounter is what I'm saying. And it makes you come alive spiritually. All right? So what does he tell us then? As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. You received him by a spiritual act. Can you say amen? amen? It was a spiritual encounter. And he says, that's how you got saved. That's how you're supposed to live now. By the Spirit, by the favor of God, by the grace of God. Okay? Now, that's a gift. Healing, deliverance, prosperity. All, it all works the same way. You believe in your heart. In other words, you've got the Word. You believe it now. It's ingrained in your thinking, especially the more you renew your mind to the Word, the more it becomes a re reality to you. And you confess that. Now, I'm not saying you just walk around, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other. I'm saying, yes, we have to speak it with our mouth, but it's because it's what is in us that we speak it. You, you, you know, out of the mouth comes the abundance of the heart. This is a spiritual thing. So we believe that we're healed. So we say we're healed even when our body's telling us something else. Just like when I got saved, it wasn't but a day or two that my mind was telling me, you're not saved. You might have had an experience. You might have had an encounter. But, buddy, you're still as screwed up as you ever were. And in many ways, I was. In some ways, I still am. But it doesn't change the reality that I am born again, that I am a spirit being, praise the Lord. And the more I operate from that spirit reality, the more I manifest the spirit that's in me, the more I manifest God, the more I see healing, the more I see breakthrough in other areas, the more other people will see him. Now, if I believe that I have the spirit of prophecy, which I do because Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, then when I come upon somebody, I shouldn't be timid about prophesying. Right? That's who I am. That's what I got. The spirit of prophecy came into me so that I could prophesy. So that unbelievers could then come into a believing relationship with God. That's just one example, but it's the same way for healing. It's the same way for everything. For me personally and for anybody that, that I then encounter. Okay? Now let me let's let's move on. Now I want to I want to look at a, two or three scriptures here, and then we'll kind of build from there. So I want to go to uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, Roberto. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 and 22. Anybody warm? Yeah. Is it hot in here? I don't know what that air is on, but I thought I had it on air for just me. Who knows? We had to turn well, way down, but you know the problem was? It was way down on heat. <laughs> Sorry about the interruption there, but you may thank me later. Stop sweating. Praise God. Okay, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Everybody say us. Yes. Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So what's being 
relayed to us here is that this isn't about what God's going to do. It's about what we're going to do in God. Amen? God's already done what he's going to do. He's born us again of his spirit so that he can now move through each and every one of us by his spirit. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. You know, we, we talk about the next revival of this and how God's going to do that. Look, God, God's not going to do anything else but what he's already done. Now, I'm not saying he won't, things won't happen that God has done, but they're going to happen because of us, because of what we do in connection with God, because of our faith in God, because of our spiritual connection with God. You know, the next time we're looking for a move of God, we ought to look in the mirror because that's where it wants to come from. Whatever it is, whether it's healing, whether it's deliverance, whether it's some, uh, you know, just use revival as an example. If we would all begin to really understand this and begin to walk in it, let me tell you, there'd be revival. First of all, I'd have revival, and then that revival would spill out of me and touch somebody else, and likewise, it would be the same thing for you. Because I can't give revival to somebody unless I've got revival, unless I'm having a, a, that spiritual awareness, okay? So here he says, for, this is uh, chapter 5, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right. Again, we got born again. We got born again, and that's over with. That's done. You are now forever saved. And this is what happened. Being made whole, you were made righteous. You were made like God again. Jesus became like us, broken, sinful. Amen. Amen. He became sin, and we became the righteousness of God. That's the great exchange, all right? Romans chapter 4 and verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. What is faith? Abraham believed God, and God called it righteousness. It's faith. Have the faith of Abraham. It isn't like i got to spend 20 days or something conjuring up this great faith. No, i just got to believe what God said. i got to believe what the Word said. Jesus, that's what Abraham said. He believed God, and God declared him righteous. He believed that he would have a child in his old age beyond the age of bearing children, and his wife beyond the age of bearing children would have a child, and they did. Not because they did anything any different than they'd ever done, but because God said, and they believed. Praise the Lord. That's operating by the Spirit. Now, he didn't have the Spirit, but he operated he didn't have the Spirit in him, but he operated by the Spirit of God because of his faith. Because he believed God, the Spirit of God moved. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Now, here, here let me just put it like this. If you want to teach a child the alphabet, you don't start by giving the child a lecture on the theory of language. Right? Because they don't, they don't have a clue what you're talking about. So instead... You give them a little wooden block or a plastic block with a letter on it, right? Yeah. Or when I was a kid in school, they had flashcards, but they served the same purpose. And every little toy store has got still got blocks with the alphabet on it, right? So you, you, the block is a visual aid to teach them how to recognize a particular letter. And as they learn, you give them more blocks with, with other letters on it. And eventually, they have a block for each letter of the alphabet. And pretty soon, they're able to put blocks together in a sequence that corresponds to the alphabet, and they make up single words. C, cat, dog, you know, the little one-syllable words that they begin with. And now they've learned the ABCs. So the blocks are visual aids that are used as object lessons to teach the alphabet. 
Praise the Lord. Now that's exactly what God did with the Bible. When I want to when I want to know how to spell a word, if I come up with a word and I don't know how to spell it, I just go to the dictionary. And we say, well, what, how's that going to help you if you don't know how to spell it? Well, I know enough of the letters that are in the word that I can find it, right? Even though I don't know how to spell the, the, the actual word, I can find it in the dictionary because I know enough letters that I know where to begin looking for, right? So here's, here's the way God does it. See, we, we perceive things through our physical senses, right? Touch, smell, see, hear, right? That's, that's the way we do. And we do that way more easily than we do with our spiritual senses. Why? Because we haven't exercised our spiritual senses the way we have our physical senses. Physical senses, that's natural. Spiritual, you've got to concentrate. You've got to operate from the spirit, right? If we get to where we're doing that on a regular basis, continuously, it will be as easy as it is to rely on your physical senses. But most of us aren't there because we have a tendency to deviate between the two. We will have, we'll be in the flesh and then we're in the spirit. And then we're in the flesh and we're in the spirit. And we, we struggle with the reality of who and what we really are, the righteousness of God in Christ, spirit being. Amen? So... We, God gives us his spirit. We renew our minds to the word of God so that we can operate spiritually. So God gave these visual aids in the Bible to the Jews in a form of religious laws and rituals that they were supposed to observe. Right? Are you still with me? Praise the Lord. That was their... That was their uh, their visual aid, their, their picture book kind of thing, was that God gave them all these rules and all these laws and all these feasts and all these different things as, as word pictures for them to, to obey, for them to observe. Now, they're important, but they're only pictures. You say, what are you talking about? Listen, we have been so ingrained. We're not Jews, but we've had the Old Testament. And we, we've heard it preached to us through churches and religion that, that that stuff is in us. And it's difficult to move from that picture book thing kind of way of looking at life in, in, into the spirit realm. More difficult than it is even for that little child when we're starting to talk to them about the, uh, you know, the... the uh, the theory of language, and they're thinking, wow, what? I don't know what you're talking about. So we give them the little block, right? They're not supposed to keep the blocks forever. When they're going, when they leave to go to university to go off to college, they don't have the little plastic bag with the blocks in it. Right? They're, they're supposed to be beyond that. But the truth is, much of the church is still dragging around the box of blocks. Praise God. So they're important, but they're only pictures. So finally, after centuries, the time came when the Jews were going to enter into the spiritual reality of these visual aids. That was the intent of God. Amen? Are you still with me? Praise the Lord. The time came that they were supposed to put away the blocks and move into the reality of what they stood for. They were supposed to be come to a place where they can operate by the spirit. The transition from the spirit or from the from the physical to the spiritual came to them in the person of Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, the spirit of God in a man. Everything that all those blocks and pictures had been showing them for centuries shows up so that they can connect spiritually rather than just physically. Amen. I'm, this is what I'm saying. So we have this born-again experience. The reason for the born-again experience is that so that we can put away the blocks. It's, an, it's a spiritual encounter so that we can move into the spirit so we can pick up 
use our spiritual senses and know what it is God's trying to do in us and through us and, 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 and other people. But we're still dragging this bag of blocks around that we're still depending on rather than identifying with the Spirit. We, it's easy to point our fingers at the Jews and say, my God, what was wrong with these people that they didn't see? We've got 2,000 years of church history and a new covenant, a new testament to read to make more sense to us. But we're still guilty of a lot of the same stuff. We had this spiritual encounter with God and we're still running around acting as though we're natural. Amen? All right, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it be fulfilled. So as long as there's somebody out there that it isn't fulfilled in, it's, it's going to remain. Right? The moment you receive Jesus, the, the law's been fulfilled as far as you're concerned. But that doesn't mean that all of the law is done away with. It means it's still out there judging and condemning and bringing other people to that place where they can receive the favor of God, the grace of God, and have spiritual birth. Amen? All right, John chapter 14 and verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou, then show us the Father? So now that the person has come, there's no need to seek God through the religious rituals. That's what Jesus was trying to, you know, to, to, to get across to everybody. In fact, God never gave the pictures as objects of affection. He gave them as visual aids to help them move into a spirit realm. God got nothing. Listen, God got, he wasn't blessed because of all the sacrifices. David saw it. He said, sacrifice and offering I would not. God, did, God didn't get pleasure out of all the butcher of animals and so on and so forth. He, did, he wasn't pleased with all of that. It was the only way for people to recognize there had to be death for sin. Something had to pay the price. Something had to be punished. Amen? So, the, 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 these were not objects of God's affection. They were The purpose for them was to point people to the person that they all represented. All right? Romans 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Rule keeping is not going to get you righteous. The moment you come to Christ, you are the righteousness of God, and it's the end of the law in terms of you trying to become better. Say amen even if you don't believe it. Praise the Lord because it's the truth. Praise God. All right, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 10 through 14. That's why it sounds like it's too good to be true. Because under any natural law or order, it is too good to be true. But because of the Spirit, it's the truth. No matter how good it is, it's the good news. Amen? Amen. So, called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, this is speaking of Jesus, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. <laughs> Physical senses. These, these, are, these are people that have been born again. But they're still so steeped in the law that he's trying to give them spiritual truths and realities, but he can't get it across to them because they're still hung up on all the other stuff. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. This is the word of righteousness. 
But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, they've got a spiritual sense. They, they can now discern what's God, what's the enemy, what's me, what's, you know what I'm saying. Praise the Lord. That's where we're supposed to be. Now, I'm not, this is not personal, right? Because I'm talking to me too. But I'm just saying, we're still teaching this. Praise the Lord. And it's not just because there's nothing else to preach or to teach. It's because we're not operating in it. You should be teaching it. Amen? You, sh you should be declaring it. You should be prophesying it. But we're still struggling. Because we haven't gotten our senses exercised to discern spirit and flesh. I mean, I tell, I tell you the truth. Sometimes I'm in a situation where I do something stupid, you know, and I'm in a, you know, a hassle with somebody or whatever it might be. And I'm 15 minutes, maybe a day later, I realize that was a spiritual battle. Anybody else ever, you ever, you know, just you're really mad or you're upset or you feel offended or you're this or you're that or the whatever. And it may be true that they ripped you off or they did this or they did that. And, and I'm just mad and I just want to, you know, let them know. And that's why we got Dish Network instead of <laughs> TV. Because mm, I just got fed up with them coming around and messing around and not doing anything. And then putting me on hold for three days and then showing up and saying, well, you know, I, we got to get this and we got to get that. And I finally just got mad and said, I don't want get it out of here. Come get it and I don't ever want to see it again. Amen. Say, well, that's not spiritual. Well, it, it became spiritual <laughs> because I felt bad for, I, I mean, I wasn't cussing anybody out, not verbally at least. But, man, I, a lot of thoughts went through my head what I, would, I need to say to him. And if I could just get him here in person and not have to talk to him over the phone, you know. So I'm just saying that just one little example. But it happens all the time. We get, we get into stuff, and it's an hour later we go, whoa, wait, what? That was a, that was a, I just lost that battle. I just gave the enemy access, praise the Lord. It's, it's because my senses aren't exercised the way they should be. To discern between the flesh and the spirit. When I'm operating in the spirit or when I'm just being stupid, just being me. Amen. Spirit sense. All right, Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child... Differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. I mean, you know, we're heirs. I already read it to you, that we are heirs, joint heirs with Jesus. It, we're the children of Abraham by faith. We have this inheritance. We're righteous. Amen? But if I don't, if I don't stay in touch with that reality, I'm no better than somebody who hasn't got it. Amen? I, I, are there things that you believe? I mean, we know God wants us to have, but for some reason we're... We're, we're, we're like a, the little child. We're not old enough, mature enough to get it. So we're really not any better than somebody who's still under the law. A servant, still trying to get work, get, you know, do enough to get it. You know, so there's no difference between them and a the servant. Though, I'm an heir, a joint heir with Jesus, Lord over everything. Man, if that doesn't describe about 75% of the Christian church, I don't know. But it's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Our senses. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to introduce us to the Spirit. So we could have our senses. Amen. Amen. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. Praise God. Everything he's got is mine. 
healing, deliverance, prosperity, supernatural, you know, words of wisdom, knowledge, prophetic, all things pertaining to life and godliness are already mine. Because these precious promises, because of my inheritance, but I'm still discerning most of my reality in the physical senses instead of my true reality, which is that I am seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and all things are mine. Amen. Praise God. See, focusing on the pictures is the physical sense. Focusing on what I feel, what I see, what I hear, what I taste, what I touch. Amen? That's the, that's, that's the pictures. That's the physical sense. That is religion. Praise God. Jesus didn't come to give us a hybrid religion. He didn't come to give us a, a, high, a, a more elevated religion. Focusing on the person is spiritual. That's the spirit sense, focusing on Jesus, and that is relationship, and that's what he came to give us. Not a better religion, not an improved religion, not a, not a more, you know, uh, beneficial religion, but a relationship, because that's what was lost. Abraham didn't have a religion. He said, well, he was circumcised. Not, he was circumcised, but that was after the fact. He already had his relationship with God. He was already called a friend of God. He was already declared to be righteous, and then he was circumcised. That's why in the New Covenant, it's over and over. Paul says, you know, circumcision avails you nothing. Amen? You, you can be circumcised and be as lost as a goose. Or you can be uncircumcised and have the circumcision of the heart and be totally connected to God. So it was a ritual. It was symbolic of the relationship. Amen? So, everybody who has the relationship with Jesus has peace with God and inheritance, healing, deliverance, prosperity. And yet, so many are still operating by the physical sense. All right, I want to show you a couple of things. Okay, Psalms uh, 62, verse 11. Psalm 62, 11. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth to God. Okay? Power belongs to God. How many can say amen? amen? All right, then let's just take it. Let's just go then to the spirit realm, to the spiritual way of thinking. Because in the natural we say, of course God has power. He is power. He's, a, he's everything. But here's discerning. By the Spirit, God's power is my power through Jesus Christ. Amen. Because of my relationship with Jesus, because I'm spiritually born again, I have an inheritance, and that inheritance is God's power is my power. Speak to the mountain. Praise the Lord. We have the power so that we live victoriously. That's not, we've already got victory over sin. That's not the issue. It's victory over the flesh, over the sense, the physical senses that are causing us to die early, to be diseased, to have sickness and, and poverty and ignorance and all the other things that come just as a natural course in a, in, in a physical person. We don't have to die at 72, whatever the lifespan is now. Thank God. I'm telling you, we can live a full life and just do everything that God has called us to do, and then just say, okay, I'm done, I'm out of here. Without fear, in peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Some of y'all get this in about 40 years. <laughs> it's becoming more of a revelation to me every day. Hallelujah. I'm just saying, you don't think about it when you don't need it. Amen? I mean, you don't think about it your foot unless it starts hurting most of the time. Am I right? I mean, it's just, it's just there. You think about it when you put your shoes on, and then you don't think about it again until you take them off. Unless that sucker starts hurting. 
And then you think about it every time you put weight on it, every time you step on it. Same way with any other part of your body. You don't think about your eyes till you can't see. Hallelujah. It's natural. Praise God. God, through Jesus, wants to restore the spiritual reality to our lives. That's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. That's why he made us born again. Adam was going around naming everything, declaring everything. He, he, he had it made. He was connected to the Spirit. That's what God has reconciled us to, that position of innocence and spiritual authority. Everywhere. And I mean everywhere. He said, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Loose it, it's loosed in heaven. Jesus has power over everything in the heavens, on the earth, and beneath the earth. And so do you, because you are an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We can shut the devil up if we just tell him to shut up. If we just believe it. When he comes to the whisper and with that, oh, that pain is back, you know, and that, you know, that thing that, you know, so-and-so had cancer, and, and, you know, this is, looks like that, and, you know all the junk that you hear that just he's rattling around in your head and every time you turn on the TV the latest you know drug for this thing or that thing and you know take this and it'll take care of that symptom of course you'll you know end up with diabetes or heart disease or some other thing you know because of it and I mean it's insane praise the Lord he gives us the Holy Spirit but the physical sense is what we're still more comfortable with, even though it's killing us, even though it's destroying what God wants to do in our lives. And it's not just about us. He can't reach other people without us. Amen? That's why he came in the flesh in the first place, to reveal himself, his spiritual reality. So for us to be born again and just keep on, you know, fumbling through life as carnal people, we're not releasing God. Other people can't see the reality of God, the supernatural of God, the healing, the deliverance, the breakthrough, the prophetic words, and all the things that we've already talked about this morning. Amen? Psalms 89, verse 15. This is one example of how God wants to do things, okay? So blessed is the people that know the joyful sound they shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance or thy presence. So, the people that know the joyful sound. One of the feasts in the, under the Old Covenant, one of the blocks, is the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is about entering into God's rest and having power. Okay? Let me show you. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 through 25. So people that know the sound are going to walk in the presence of God. And here's where that comes from. The Feast of uh, Trumpets comes back to Leviticus where the law was given. The Lord spake unto Mo Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, and we know seven is the day of rest or the, the, the number of rest. The seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a day of rest, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Okay? Here's just one example. Joshua. The angel appears. He said, I'm going to tell you how to win the battle. You're not going to win it. The Lord's going to win it. I want you to just walk around this thing for seven days or for six days. And then on the seventh day, we're going to blow a trumpet. And you're going to rest, and the walls are going to fall down. Okay? That's, a, that's another block. That's another picture that God's trying to show us a spiritual reality. Okay? So the Israel looks at this. Now, look at Revelation chapter 4, 
in verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I'm going to show you things which must be hereafter. And then it goes on to talk about Jesus. This is about Jesus. Amen? So, Jesus is the commander of the army of God. Amen? He is the Lord. He is the horn of our salvation. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The Feast of Trumpets was just a block, just a picture, just that Jesus is all of that and, and so much more. Amen. He's our rest. We can rest. We can relax because we've got all power. Nothing can overcome us. All we got to do is speak the trumpet. Whatever you ask in my name, I'm going to do it. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Hallelujah. Right? Just march around for six days on that Sabbath. Just rest on the seventh day and, and speak the name of Jesus. Just rest in what he has done and speak that name to your infirmity, to your poverty, to your dysfunction. Are you hearing me? I mean, this, this is what we're, this is what, see, we're still, we're still blowing ram's horn. I mean, I'm not against it. I get the symbolism and, you know, what, it, what we're trying to provoke. But the truth is, I, I am a trumpet, praise the Lord. I, I am the ram's horn. I have Christ in me. We, we, see, we've got to grow up. Or we're just servants. We're not, we're, we're not any better off than if we were still under the old covenant. We have salvation because of a sacrifice, but we still are struggling with every other issue in our life because we don't take authority, because we don't rest in the finished work of Christ, because we don't blow our temper, because we don't speak the truth of Jesus Christ into that situation. Okay, um, I'm going to quit pretty soon because I'm not done. Second Corinthians again, let's go back there, uh, chapter 1 and verse 20 and 20 through 22. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. And I'm not chastising anybody. I hope you don't, don't get offended here. I'm speaking to me. I'm telling you, I know I, I live this the same as everybody else does. We, we got to just grow up. Amen. We've got to start taking some meat. We've got to start realizing who we are, what we are, and what God is wanting to do through us. Yeah. And quit sitting around about, wow, you know, you don't know my problem. I don't, I mean, it's not like I don't care about your problem. But if you've got a problem, you need to blow the trumpet. Yeah. Hallelujah. I mean, you need to be doing something about it. Yeah. Because as long as we're waiting for somebody else to pray the prayer, right. we're not praying for the people that are needing us. Yeah. Oh, oh, yo, priest. You know, kings and priests. When we should be teaching. For all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen and the glory, uh, under the glory of God by us. Now we would establish us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. All right. And now Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 again. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, here's the deal. Paul's revelation of the righteousness, of our righteousness, by his definition, it takes spiritual sense. By his own definition. You can't get this intellectually. That's why you can get born again and never operate in, the, in, the, in your righteousness. Because you get born again by the Spirit, and then you try to intellectualize everything from that point on. You can't intellectualize your righteousness. Because everything in the natural realm will tell you you're not righteous. Sometimes you might be a little bit, and other times you're just, you missed it by a mile. Hallelujah. Righteousness is the right and the ability to approach God. Without the remembrance of sin in my mind, 
or in his mind. Oh, man. See, if we really, if we could really get that deep down inside of us, I, I, maybe I'm just dancing, you know, slow, but I don't always feel that way. I, I sometimes wonder, did God remember that? I mean, he, I, you know, this is the whole point of it. Righteousness. It has to be, you've got to do it by spiritual senses. You can't do it in the natural. You've got to just trust. You've got to just believe. You've got to just have faith in his grace. Because he wants to give us all things. But he gives all things to the righteous. And if i got a guilty conscience, I'm not coming to him with any expectation. I'm kind of just coming in the back door with my hand out hoping for a little something. When he wants to give me all things. Praise God. Isaiah 43 and verse 25. Just, I want us to see these things, but not, I want us to see them just like we just, I just showed you with the trumpet. Let's don't, don't read them and think, you know, yeah, but it's so complicated. It's not. It's all about Jesus and everything is about what he has done already. So I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake. Not for your sake, just because that's how good I am. I can't help myself. And will not remember your sins. Man, I mean, when I really think about that, when I meditate on that, it makes me want to shout and dance and do any other thing possible because it's just so insanely good. It's crazy good. Praise God. Transgressions that are blotted out become non-existent. There's not a shadow. There's nothing. They, they're just, they do not exist. Sins that are not remembered cannot disqualify you from the blessings of God. If he can't remember them, he can't disqualify you from the blessing. He chose to blot them out and to not remember. When we were born again, God chose by an act of his own will, we just read it, for his sake, to obliterate from his memory all of our sin, past, present, future. And it has to be because everything was future when he did it. Amen. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. See, we, we just really need to be meditating and thinking with spiritual senses about this because if we did, we'd be the happiest people on the planet. We'd be full of joy. We'd have peace. Amen. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And we'd have power, amen, that the enemy could never resist because it's the power of God. Hallelujah. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hallelujah. See, God not remembering our sin anymore is the key to knowing him. You can be comfortable with him. You can talk to him like you talk to the person that you're closest to on this earth, only even more so because he knows the stuff that even that person you're closest to doesn't know. In fact, he knows stuff you don't even know. But he still loves you. He's still perfectly in love with you. Amen? Now, I'm not saying all this because I'm, I'm going to say some stuff now that may confuse, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe in replacement theology. God is using the Jews. He's going to fulfill his promise to them. All of that's a reality. So I'm not denying that. I'm not trying to get past that. I'm just saying there's another spiritual truth uh, that we need to sense from, from the Spirit. Amen? So Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. 31 and verses 33 uh, and 34. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God 
and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, and they sh for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So he puts his word in our mind, in our heart, but in the deepest part of us. Amen? That's why sometimes you can, you can be ministering to somebody, and you don't know the scripture. You can't recall the verse, but you know the principle. And you can apply the, the principle to their life or to their situation or their circumstance without actually quoting a verse from the Bible. Did it ever happen to anybody? Why? Because God has put his word in your heart. How many know how many translations there are? I don't have a clue. There's thousands if not hundreds of thousands, when you think of all the different languages as well as the translations just in English alone. So which one is the one you would call on anyhow? You know what I'm saying? So God is putting his word in us, not a particular translation, not, you know, but one thing is the principle, the truth of God's word is in us. He put it in us when we were born again. So we don't really have to be teaching one another the word if we would just rely on our spiritual sense. We'd operate it in all the time. We're fearful. Because if a scripture doesn't come to my mind that I can quote, maybe I'll be out of the will of God. No, I won't. He's with me. He never leaves me or forsakes me. Hallelujah. He knows our humanity, right? All right, look at now Galatians chapter 4, verse 22 through 31. I'm going to quit at noon, so if I'm not done, we'll do. Galatians 4, uh, verse 22 through 34. Or excuse me, 22 through 31. I forgot you're totally confused now, Roberto. It is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. He who was of the bondwoman was born of the flesh, but he that was free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which generate generous gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. But this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, say praise the Lord, is free, which is the mother of us all. That's those, you know. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth into, and cry thou that prevailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now think about this for a minute. This is written to Jews. This is under the Old Covenant. But he's talking about us. They had a husband whom they were unfaithful to over and over and over, which is why we have the book of Hosea and so many others that talk about it. But God's going to speak to the barren, the ones who don't have his spirit, who are not, don't have a husband. And they are going to rejoice and break forth and cry. Thou that travailest not, for the desolate has many more children than she which had a husband. It's called revival. Praise the Lord. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Okay, where were we? Okay, there we go. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. This is New Covenant, okay? But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. What we read in Jeremiah, is written to us. It's a prophetic word. Yes, it was true of the Jew, but he was speaking to us. Amen. Persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, the way I know, how I know that Jeremiah is written to us because the Jews still don't know. He put it in our hearts. They're still operating solely by the sense throne because they don't have the Holy Spirit unless they're Messianic Jews, unless they're born again. They're still operating under the, the old blocks and, and pictures and symbols. Amen. We are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. The point being, 
the church, we are the Israel of God. Again, I'm not, I'm not talking replacement theology. I'm just saying that's what he said. We are the Israel of God from above. Hallelujah. So in Jeremiah, he declares that he will covenant to remember our sin no more. The blood of Jesus serves as the agreement between God and us that he'll never remember our sin again. We don't have to teach each other to know the Lord. We all know him because he recreated us spirit beings. He had us born from above. We're now spiritual. Amen? So we're now have the ability to operate from the spirit sense and he remembers our sins no more. And then he put our, his love, he says, in our inward parts and wrote it in our hearts. That gives spirit sense. I'm not going to go to the scriptures for the sake of time, but in John <coughs> chapter 13, he says, Here's the law, the new covenant law, the law of uh, the New Testament or the new covenant. It's the law of love, right? Well, then James says, he calls it this. He says, it's the law of liberty. So you're free to love because you've been loved to the extreme. It gives you freedom. Liberty. You're not in bondage anymore. You've been set free. Free to live your life. Free to, to ex expect every good and perfect gift to be yours. Praise the Lord. That's why we preach grace. That's why we preach righteousness. Because it is only sensed or known by the Spirit. Praise the Lord. People that reject it, you, can, you, you just write it down. I'm not being judgmental or critical. I'm just saying they're not operating from the, from the Spirit. Or they would sense the truth of it. It's written in our heart. It may be too good for our natural mind to, to believe, but something resonates with us when we hear it, and it's just like, oh, man, God is so good. Praise the Lord. Look at Hebrews 8 and verse 12. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Praise the Lord. I've said that multiple times here this morning, but sadly there are some that teach you to try and produce holiness. Even your own conscience and certainly the enemy. But it actually ends up condemning you. And it leaves you a sense of physical sense of disqualification disqualified from the presence of God, disqualified from the power of God, disqualified from the provision of God. 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verses 5 through 7. For now the end of the commandment is love, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. This, is, this, this happened in the, in the, like within 30 years of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And it still goes on today to an even greater degree. Teaching the law and focusing on performance doesn't work. It doesn't work. He said, where sin abounds, the law is taught. Wherever the law is taught, he said, sin abounds. But where sin abounds, grace doth that much more abound. Praise the Lord. We are the righteousness of God without the law of Moses because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If we aren't under the law of Moses, 
but under the, the grace of Jesus. The law is not talking to us. Anytime you hear the law speaking, you get to look over your shoulder because it's talking to somebody else. It's not talking to you. In fact, the law stopped the mouth, it says, and the whole world became guilty before God. So nobody could say, hey, well, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm keeping the law. Even Paul talked about being a Pharisee of Pharisees, but he was still a failure because he couldn't keep all the law. So the law shuts the mouth of people who are trying to claim to be justified. Christ has justified us, or literally, he has made us righteous. Something the law can never do. When you hear the law, you write it down. It's the enemy, or it's your carnal mind, it's your physical sense trying to disqualify you for something that God has already qualified you for. Because the law is not to you. The law does not speak to us. Has nothing to do with us. Beyond the fact that Jesus fulfilled it. And that frees us from guilt. Finally, by the law, he says, is the knowledge of sin. Paul said it himself. If it hadn't been for the law, I wouldn't know that I was a covetous man. I seen the law and I realized everything I look at I want, no matter who it belongs to. Praise the Lord. But in the sacrifice of Christ, according to Hebrews 10, verses 2 and 3, you don't have to go there, Roberto, sin has been purged. And the worshiper should not have consciousness or remembrance of sin. Praise the Lord. How, how freeing would that be? But if we keep going back and listening and allowing our senses to dictate to us, we're always conscious of it. You see what I'm saying? Where God has said, I've purged you. I've blotted out your sin, your transgressions. I'm not going to remember them anymore. It's all over. They're gone. So don't, have a, don't even have a consciousness of it. If the thought comes, rebuke it. Even if it's true in the natural, it's a lie in the spirit, and that is the ultimate truth. Galatians 5 and 1 says that bondage is the work of the law. And we read just a few moments ago how that those that are that are uh, under the law are in bondage. They're still in chains. Your inheritance is by grace instead of works of the law. And that, that's the entire subject of the book of Galatians if you want to just read it sometime. All have sinned, he said, and come short of the glory of God. The glory of God is the manifested word of God. Right? We know in John 1, 1 and John 1, 14, he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the glory of God is the manifested word of God. Initially, that was Jesus, the word, come in the flesh. Now it's wherever this word manifests, whether it's in a healing or a deliverance or a prophetic word or whatever it is, that's the glory of God, right? So the reason we haven't seen the glory of God is because we're majoring on sin and natural senses, amen, instead of our deliverance and our righteousness and spiritual senses. Amen. I'm finishing. You are the righteousness of God. You do not come short of the glory of God. You are a manifestation of the glory of God. Woo! You ought to just shout about that for a minute. Praise God. You are a manifestation of God. You are a revelation of the glory of God. You're not coming short of the glory. You are the glory. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. It's yours. Every manifestation, every promise in him is yea and amen. All things are yours, hallelujah, that pertain to life and godliness. If he gave us Christ, how will he not much more give us all things? Boy, I mean, if we could just get our spirit sense in tune with that. 
I'm telling you, I've got, I just got goosebumps running up and down all over me, and I know that that's my flesh, but that's just because, I'm telling you, it's resonating. I know, I know this is the truth. I don't have to convince myself. God already has it in us to know it. And everything in our spirit connects with that and resonates with it and says, oh, Lord, it's like, it's, it, it's like he says in all of humanity and every rock in the earth is crying out for the manifestation of the sons of God. Amen. Even we ourselves in our spirit, it, it's like just clawing at the inside of us saying, let me out, let me be, let, me, let who you really are be. Yeah. Praise God. And it's ours by the Spirit. When we sense it by the Spirit, we'll walk in it. We'll walk in the Spirit. As we were born in the Spirit, we will walk out our life in that same Spirit. You just got to get bold enough to do it. I'm telling you, whenever you pick up the Scripture, you need to start thinking spiritually. I mean, you need to just, don't let that enemy, don't let your conscience, don't try to bring up junk that you did five minutes ago or that you're thinking about you might do tomorrow. Forget about it. There is no consciousness of sin in us. We have been purged from it all. We are glorious. We are the, the creation of God Almighty. And he refuses to know anything about us failing. Your sins and iniquities, I remember no more. I have blotted out every transgression. They don't exist. The only thing about you that exists in reality is a perfect spirit being. That can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Give him a hand this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Amen. We, we, we just gotta, we gotta keep reminding ourselves. We gotta keep ourselves in tune with who we really are. Because our flesh will drag us right back down into the gutter in the way that we think. And this world is created or is ruled by the God of this world, little G who operates totally, I mean, all you got to do is turn on the TV, the radio, whatever. It's all about the flesh. Everything is sense realm. You have to fight against it. That's the battle. When it talks about, you, you know, you're, we're going to be blessed with Christ. We're going to be glorified with Christ if we suffer with him. That's the suffering, church. The suffering is to believe who you really are. That's what Jesus fought. I am the son of God. Father and I are one. He fought against all of the negativity that said, you cannot be. That's blasphemy. You're a liar. You're, you're, you're a devil. The battle that we're fighting, we're not going to be crucified on the cross. What we have to crucify is the flesh in the sense that we let it dictate who we are. Jesus fought that battle for 33 and a half years. He didn't just, he, or 33 years, whatever it was, not just when he went to the cross. He had to fight it every single day because he was constantly being told, you're the son of, a, 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 of an unwed mother. You're that guy that starts with a B. You know what I'm talking about. You're not legitimate. You ever hear that? You're not legitimate? I'm not talking about born out of wedlock, I'm talking about you're not a legitimate child of God. You're not really God's manifestation here in this earth. That's the same old lie that keeps going. That's your struggle. That's, your, that's what you suffer with. Fighting against it by faith. Believing what God's word says about you in spite of what the devil says and in spite of what everybody else or anybody else might say. That was the battle Jesus fought for 33 years. That's the battle you'll have to fight as long as we're in this flesh. But he has told us you're more than an overcomer. Because I have overcome, you will overcome. Amen? Give him another hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And i got to shut up and repent because I've already lied. It's six after 12. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your weekend. Enjoy the time with family, friends, and uh, have a good time. Keep reminding yourself who you are in Christ. All things are possible if you can believe. Amen? You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you all.